Today, Esports Demystified is joined by Dr. Miles Harvey. Miles is an esports coach, media literacy educator, and teacher educator at the University of New Mexico. Miles is also a huge advocate for digital game-based learning within the education curriculum. With this passion, Miles has built a course based on the studies of new literacies and digital game-based learning strategies called media literacy. The course uses virtual reality, augmented reality, and virtual spaces to explore what it means to take meaning in new places where students often spend their time when they're away from school. With Miles' expertise with us, we're going to dig into this exciting landscape of changing education curriculum with gaming support. Miles, thank you for joining us today. Hey, good to be here. Well, so when we were doing our research um, on, on what you're up to and, and your current career, one of the things that really stuck out to us is you've been really innovative in your approach to teaching. Um, and it seems you're constantly trying to innovate in the education field. Where does this passion come from? You know, I think as a struggling student growing up and uh, somebody looking to play video games sometimes instead of reading that book, uh, somewhere between, you know, scouting and hockey, somewhere between having a Nintendo 64 and also caring about, you know, science, everything somehow between middle school and high school just started to weave together. And I think it was after like the Nintendo 64, like blew my mind growing up, you know, and I was like, whoa, like, okay, now I can envision these stories that I'm reading about. Now I can, like, it almost helped me to think about like three dimensional places. And when my teacher would read all of a sudden, now I could like, I could like perceive that 3D world, like Super Mario 64. And mm -hmm. I was imagining running around like the characters in the books. And so I think for me, it was as natural as someone growing up and being influenced by the movies or the literature or the surrounding um, culture. I think, I think games are the culture I grew up in. And therefore I have this, this gamer lens that I think, you know, we, we just naturally maybe take, you know, it for granted. But I think when you look at uh, the average age of like a teacher being 42 in New Mexico, where I live, and the average age of a gamer being 34 in the United States, I think, you know, we're seeing these people grow and turn into teachers and we're turning into administrators and they know games, they played games. Whereas mm -hmm. maybe the people who were traditionally in school before teaching maybe didn't have that initial experience. And I'm not talking about like the 80s, early 90s games. Like M when NBA Live 95 came out, like, all right, games started to get good. They were, you know, and all of a sudden um, these consoles were producing content that had literary merit. And, you know, without my teachers assigning me to play Zelda, I certainly was. And I was learning about narrative and stories and, yeah, I was trying to do and read theirs. and But I think that's where it comes from. I think it came from subconsciously picking up these, this gamer lens, this way of kind of looking at the world. And I remember going to college and then people telling me about this way of life. And I was like, wait, like, I, that's me. Like, wait a minute. Like, no, 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 wait, I don't know. Like, I, people are telling me, this is what gamification and digital game-based learning is. And I was like, it sounds like, it sounds like I am that like, you know, I just felt like I was also like, is that, I think that's that me. That's where it all comes from. I this realization that like it was there all along, kind of like what, what we hope educators put into all their students, all these skills that they kind of just don't realize they have. And then they, then they have that great realization they can read or write well or whatever. So esports has been like this thing where like all of a sudden it evolved from gaming and being a kid and, you know, being a hockey player and, being exploratory in scouts and knowing how like learning and education all weaves together. It was just like a perfect marriage. Amazing. Okay. And for people who don't know, what, what is digital game-based learning? Um, what is this thing that you've, you've been really trying to integrate into, into your curriculums? You know, it's digital game-based learning is, is about making sense of the digital world by playing and exploring in it. And, you know, I think a lot of us have a pretty nuanced idea about what that might be. You know, we might think of a particular game or, or using something in our classroom that is um, virtual and it's game-based. And, you know, it stems from the game-based learning theory and model. Mm -hmm. Now we're adding this digital thing. You know, this is, 
this is a, a multimodal kind of like media based approach towards game based, you know, activities. And so for me, I've been more of like a popular game kind of user and I'll bring in something like Uncharted or um, I remember when, uh, well, when Final Fantasy, uh, the remake came out, I brought it in the day after it came out, you know, and we played it in a class and started looking at the story. So we're taking actual games that are popular, like those, those $65 games at Target or Hastings or whatever uh, company you're around that sells media and technology all over the world, the popular AAA titles, the things that yeah. kids pl probably play at home. You know, I it, try and put those in the classroom. Uh, it's funny that you bring that up because I, I, I was, when we were doing some research into, into past conversations you've been involved with, um, someone kind of, I think they used the analogy of GTA being used as a, as a and I know like a certain, you know, GTA obviously has its, uh, its critics. We're going to keep jumping um, at me through the window now. We're already yeah, talking about this. Yeah, yeah. But they talked about GTA, uh, like it or not, having the ability to teach you geography, <laughs> mapping, you could say driving skills if, if, if it's in the right format, but um, it, it's, would you agree with that in a, in a lot of ways? I would argue that GTA provides us with a more immersive playground to learn than any company that I have ever seen create something for their kids. And, and mm. who could compete against one of the most popular games in the world? And people go, oh, but I'm, you know, but the things you can do in that game, I'm like, have you seen reality? <laughs> it's based on LA. I was like, where this is, this is like, this is the safest place in the world to be despite, you know, the realities of the, the real one, you know, and we get to act out Shakespeare and uh, you know, it's, it's very interesting when you're, when you listen to your students trying to figure out what, where the setting of this play is going to be based on the scene and then looking at the context clues and they're like, Oh, there's this place on the map by the airport. It's got this perfect scene. We're going to set it up here. And then all I've never heard such learning in the decade. I've been trying to teach Shakespeare and all kinds of stuff. And here are these kids unbeknownst to the, you know, to the world and, and they're out there changing costumes and acting out voices. And, and they got, there's nothing better when you go first person in a car with your students acting out lines, you know, and they're all sharing their piece. And it's just, it's a whole new world, right? And, and what type of teachers go into the field with that type of maybe awareness? And I think it's very few, right? I mean, how many people play GTA? A lot. But if we look at the, like the people who play it, you know, you got to start thinking, all right, out of that percentage, how might be, how many might be teachers, right? And how, you know, what, and I think there is a big thing here with this topic to say, hey, you know, that there is more to games than just what, you know, what meets the eye at first glance. You know, any type of media is a playground for your curricular goals. And so if you're playing Fortnite, same thing. Great. Maybe you don't want the reality of the world just yet. Okay, well, let's back it up. Let's use this three dimensional place. Let's use Fortnite Creative. There's lots of articles to to back up the research using, you know, acting and speaking and listening and reading writing skills in something like Fortnite or something quite literal like Skyrim, where you can read books in a virtual world. Like, or we can go even more primary and say, well, let's do Minecraft and we can build the classroom and kids can virtually be in it and read together in that setting. And so all of a sudden people are like, okay, well, I'm okay with those last couple options. Whereas you might be teaching 17, 18, 19 year olds or teaching a college class and you're more than happy to, to pick the most real environment because you know that you can set the boundaries and protocols for your students. And a lot of parents are like, and, and teachers like, well, how do you, how do you make sure they're not acting crazy? I'm like, how do you know in their breakout rooms on Google classroom, they're not yelling at each other. We don't, we have the faith of the protocols that people are going to abide by what we expect in our classroom. And if that mediated space is a game, I bet you they're going to adhere to that because you're probably the teacher who is open-minded enough to even do this. And your students are going to be like, oh my gosh, this teacher's awesome. I, I can agree with that because I think if I had you as a teacher, you would be my favorite teacher, definitely. Uh, <laughs> and um, and this, like, I have one question that is related because um, as you can imagine, 
when I went to school, um, game was like the, the nightmare of everyone, my parents and my, my teachers, because they were the thing that drew me out of the books, right? As you, you mentioned. And, and you, you seem to manage to have made this relation inside your classroom. So I bet your students, like you're one of the favorite teacher of your students. Um, but uh, one thing that uh, uh, I want to understand, and it's kind of still a little bit blurry in my mind, would you be able to give, for example, like one specific example on how you brought one of those famous games inside your classroom and what, what teaching went out of that um, for your students? So parents could understand what kind of, uh, if they don't have the opportunity to have their kid in your school, then um, um, they can understand what can they teach their uh, kids as well and maybe play with their kids to teach them similar things. Oh man, that's a good question. Thank you. I can think of the last the two, we've played two games in full this year virtually. I've never met my students yet. First one was Final Fantasy 13. Um, and we studied, you know, society, the futurism, AI, um, sustainability, um, political, like propaganda. And um, then the last one we just finished for the third nine weeks was Uncharted, The Lost Legacy. And uh, it's about two female protagonists in India. So we also coupled with that Hindu mythology. So we basically did a unit on Hindu mythology but we played Uncharted and then we also streamed it live. So I was on my like PlayStation streaming it to YouTube. My students would log into Google Classroom. I'd share the link. We'd all watch live and they could chat and inform my decisions because we're not in person, right? So I still found a way to get, um, I call it a game allowed. You know, most people just call it streaming, but most people don't stream to a class of students five times a day. I call that teaching. And so I do feel like a streamer at times, but I've learned that, you know, from all the times I used uh, like book on tapes or, or you know, like uh, books on YouTube, I realized that a game through walk through watching someone else play is the same thing um, as listening to a book and following along. And so we use like a popcorn um, gaming approach when we're in person, I'll pass that controller around like one book in a classroom and we all listen. And it's much more manageable because in the reality of things, you can talk while people are gaming and inform that. I call it backseat gaming. You know, you can be like, no, go left, go left. No, why would you do that? You never want to end up with the controller in one of those moments where everyone's freaking out because, and it always ends up with that one student who has no idea what to do and everyone's losing it. And it's just the best moment, right? Um, and moments like that, we play Detroit Become Human and a character's gone as a result of like your decisions, you know, and people are just like, are you kidding me? I haven't heard that type of investment from my students ever, right? And I, and I do teach traditional literature and I'd make them read Shakespeare and we do read different stuff. We, uh, but, but I've never seen kids get out of their desk and, and do some of the things they've done and in VR reach for things because they think they're there. I mean, we're talking about the most empathetical things ever. These characters don't just get to follow the linear paths of the characters in traditional literature. They get to have the narrative agency to walk left or right or open or close or kill or, or whatever. And it's changing the way they perceive literature. It's amazing. I can imagine the engagement of your student in your class. I remember when I was in school, the most exciting thing that I had was when there was, uh, the teacher was going to put a movie on and we would discuss it uh, 10 minutes. On the cart? After. Would they bring it on the cart? Or exactly. Yeah, the cart, cart was so the sick. The cart was amazing. Yeah, this was the best. When, when you, I, I remember one teacher didn't tell us what, uh, what he would do. And when we would see just the card coming in, everyone would just like start jumping and say, well, this is the best time this ever. This is gonna be sick. <laughs> Turn so the with down. video games and, and controller going around, I can imagine uh, how different the classroom can be. Um, one of the follow-up question I have on that is, um, how, how is your class preparation done? Do you prepare it, like, do you, see a game and then go play that game and understand what you can teach through that game or you have the opposite process where you know what you want to teach and you fit that you took to take the right game for that oh that's a that's a good question I, you know 
I think it falls in line with how I would choose any resource, right? I would, I feel like, first off, I may be influenced by something I see or hear, or maybe something I've played before. Um, or sometimes I know that let's say like the next series of a game is going to be, is going to have the ESRB rating that fits my students. You know, it's going to be like, all right, teen, I'm teaching middle school. So I say, okay, 13 year olds, T for teen. And then I might um, like once a year for me, I like to choose one thing that's coming out that's brand new if possible. And I play it as soon as it comes out. Like I make my curriculum fall in line with the launch. So it's exciting. No one can be ahead. And in those moments, I think you have to be more of a, a gamer or at least rely on knowing someone who's going to in the class stream it for you. You could do the flipped model and say, oh, well, mister, I have that. Can I stream it for the class and I'll put up the copies? Sure. Do you want to basically play? Yeah. So I, if you can't generate the content and you can't find someone online already doing it for free, your students will. You're, you have 100 students. The chances are if even 1% of them wants to do it, that is enough, right? And so uh, mm -hmm. in addition, I think we are not necessarily um, always in supposed to be in charge of, of, of maybe guiding the lesson, but I think maybe our job as educators sometimes is just to provide the right resources. I, in Minecraft, it's a good example. I don't know necessarily undefined learning outcomes. I don't know what they're going to build sometimes, but I do know the processes and things that they're doing that that's getting them to do and make stuff. And that's the cool thing. You know, if I asked everyone to draw a tree, it would look different. And I think for our learning, that's the perception we want is, is I can provide my familiarity with games, just like the familiarity with I have with books. But you don't see this, you don't see video games for young adults as a course that, that you know, uh, teachers are taking all around. It's mm -hmm. not like grammar, right? It's not like books for young adults. How many, you have to take that as a language arts teacher. And then there's some like, you know, film or comic books, and there's lots of cool immersive things. But I think video games is that one thing so far that has yet to kind of be, you um, mass disseminated as an ideology and a way of being. I mean, we're there, but it's taken like the research we're doing as a result of maybe these last five years to kind of get us to a point where we moved from theory to now some practice to maybe some pedagogy strategies. And now people are going, oh yeah, because of this and that, now we have this. Where it really stemmed from people playing games, some older people going, hey, wait, that's important people growing up and then going, well, we use it. And then other people <laughs> going, well, we should do some research. And then all of a sudden people are now like, and you said this before, video games were like demonized. You know, ever since like 2001, you know, when, when Doom got a bad rep and it was all about, you know, if your kid plays games, they're gonna be, they're gonna be in bad shape. It just thinks, it makes me think of rock and roll, rap music, whatever the newest genre, yeah. whatever. It's like, if you use it, you are in big, oh my goodness. <laughs> so we moved a long way from that though. And so here we are. And I can testify that ever since I played God of War 4, I've become obsessed with Norse mythology. So, and I spend a lot of time at my uh, partner's expense uh, researching and looking up <laughs> Norse mythology, but it has got me reading a lot more. It's got me, you know, integrating it and learning about cultures that, um, you know, I didn't know it was so incredible. Like in the storytelling um, and, and in that part of, you know, their society, which I thought was really cool. Um, I, I want to, I just want to ask it once more, if even after this incredible explanation you've given us of the benefits of getting games to allow kids to engage more in the classroom and then obviously using the right game to get them reading or, or interacting and learning, if you still had a parent who, who couldn't, get past the concept of a game being in the classroom or a computer game in the classroom, how would you, how would you help them understand at a parent's level, I guess, um, almost explaining it from a different angle to, to help them gather why, why this is so useful and important? Oh, well, you know, I would say that, that students in this, if, if your kid is, 
in first grade or in 12th grade, they have grown up in a world that is immersed with technology that they might have learned how to interact and make things happen on a screen before they, you know, learn all these symbols before they learn the symbols of what letters are and what they sound like. They learn the shapes of what things are on the screen and what they do. And they've been making sense of the world in different ways than we can perceive because we didn't grow up in a world with iPads. I mean, we started using them, but we certainly didn't grow up before we could speak learning to make sense of these spaces. And I think the important part is that we have to keep the perspective of the students alive. So even in 50 years from now, the main goal will be to think like a second grader and what are they perceiving? What are they watching? What did they grow up messing with? And how, you hear this all the time. Kids are like, how do they get into my phone? And like, they're just like, they, they've taken <laughs> photos or whatever. I'm like, I don't know, that's them. They're so smart right now. Like their brain is trying so hard to make sense of the world that if this is what you give them. They're gonna apply all that energy to it. And whether they're watching their, their parents game when they were babies or they had the headsets on, all the things I see, it's influencing them. And they go to school and they learn how to enunciate and pronounce and calculate and critically think. And a lot of it's kind of embedded in their life already at home, what they're playing, what they're doing when they're you know, in the living room watching. Or, and hmm. then they get to school and then all of a sudden we just ignore it. We just all never, never bring it up. You know, student, 97% of students play video games and they play up to like 20 hours a week. And I think, you know, even when we get students to casually read traditional text, um, we still don't, re we don't, we underestimate how much digital time they're spending. So there's just like, there's that piece. And then there's just the science behind it that just shows, you know, there's, there's a lot of theory and a lot of research behind the parallels between literature and digital game-based learning, you know, and that's the literary theory. That's the, um, that's the James G um, linguist, video game scholar, moving into people that are maybe uh, now more concurrent, like Constance Steinkuhler and Kurt Squire, um, who worked um, with James and, and now they're doing stuff at like UCI eSports and they, they represent NASEF and there's this dissemination of theory and knowledge that's been adopted by teachers and then they've put these theories of like, oh, the fact that when we're walking around in a gaming world, we're exploring this space, what if we, instead of teaching, here's a good example for this argument is teaching Shakespeare, a lesson I did last year, we had five stations one Oculus Go, a PlayStation 4, a, an old act, one of like the 57, you know, Sir Conan Arthur Doyle texts of Shakespeare. We had like the BBC current Shakespeare knockoff, you know, Netflix, whatever. Um, and we had the board game Clue. Now it would be Among Us. I would rotate that station and just place it with Among Us. And they would rotate for four days each at each station and experience Sherlock Holmes on the PlayStation 4. Then go read a traditional text four days later. And then they go use the VR and actually go do like a spooky kind of mystery thing. And, then, and, and it would be like a five week unit. They'd all rotate and kids would be like, Shakespeare, is, I mean, uh, Sherlock Holmes is so awesome. Like, <laughs> and that was the coolest part. You know, they, they wanted to play around with Sherlock Holmes Basset Hound and they wanted to change Sherlock Holmes avatar to give him a mustache. That's how you get kids to love literature. You let them play with it. You don't make them analyze iron big pentameter in Shakespeare. You have them investigate the clues along Sherlock Holmes while you're reading it. I mean, come on, if, listen, pretend this, if Shakespeare was around today, you think he'd be writing plays or would he be using the most immersive technology ever to produce his stories? So yeah. why do we not use the most immersive tech now to keep those universal themes alive? That's what gets kids to be interested in Othello and the universal themes in it is the fact that they get to experience it first. Because if you don't make it through, then you'll never get it. And if you pick the hardest way possible, then what do you expect? Yeah, no, it's incredible. That's really amazing and uh, comparison. Uh, I never thought about that, bringing back geniuses and seeing what they would actually do, because um, you know what they would probably do, <laughs> which is similar to most successful people, right? They use, they, they're either creating the new technology or they're using the most up-to-date technology to its, you know, to its inch of its life, to seeing how far they can take it. 
I was going to ask if you're someone um, who really is interested in integrating digital game based learning into their into their classroom. Maybe you don't have that much experience. Where should you start? Where is a, a good place to start learning how to bring this into the classroom? I would say um, a good conversation to have is one that begins with your students. Say, you know, I've been interested in this gaming thing. Before you even say that, kids in the chat virtually or in class are going to be like, wait, well, what? What? Well, what? Well, what? And they're going to freak out. And you'll say, well, I just was. I'm interested what might be an interest, you know, what, what could be a game we could all play in here? If, if that doesn't elicit a response out of anyone in your class, then I would be surprised. And um, if I asked the same question about a book, I honestly would expect chirps sometimes, you know, and, I, and I'm building a love of literature, but I think it stems a little bit from um, them wanting this wow factor. I mean, we as teachers can make that wow factor out of anything we teach. Um, the cool thing is though, when we introduce games, there's a big buy-in already from kids that they're willing to participate. So if you, if you ask kids, hey, you know, well, what might be an interesting game that, that fits in with this unit that I'm gonna be doing in a couple months? I'm interested in teaching a, a mythology unit. And all of a sudden, you know, kids' minds are thinking about whatever, or, Maybe like my next unit coming up is a game design pitch unit. And all it is, is a short story design unit, but I just now turned story into game. And now the story is in the game and now they're making a game. And that is far more exciting to them than making a short story that they're going to end up revising and editing. Now they're gonna be using RPG Playground. Now they're designing the game intro music. Now they're designing the characters and their conflict and what's happening. I'm like, ah, oh, remember Othello? And they're like, oh yeah, okay. So there's gotta be something inside that drives the main character. I'm like, now we go, what is that character's story? And they're like, uh, he was he was hurt when he was a kid. I'm like, all right, build on it, you know? And, and that's kind of the thing is like, for a teacher who's like, well, how do I put games into my unit? You start with a little supplementary piece. You don't have to teach a whole story and, and be make that the primary learning vehicle. You could, but we all know as teachers that the story is just a front for whatever else we're teaching. You know, there's all these other lessons that go with the story. It's never just about the story. We always talk about the story. We have activities with the story. And you know, if, if it was just all about the games, kids would just be gaming, but that's not. There's activities, there's speaking and listening and reading and writing. There's Socratic seminars. There's anything thing you could do with the book you could do with the game and you don't even have to play the game you could just watch a level from a game already on youtube for free and you, you don't even have to own the game so there's just so many free resources i just thought it was so cool to think that like every game that someone might want to play it's probably already been played and online for free for someone to watch without any bad cussing or anything and you could drop that into your lesson and i think I think most teachers are artisans and they know kind of when to add certain types of texts or resources or poetry. Cause like, just say this, like I would never just have a poetry unit. I'll add poetry into my units, but I, I would never go for five weeks. We're going to read poetry. Ooh, and then we're going to end with you writing it. Ooh. No, we're going to be reading and writing poetry throughout the year. And you know what? It's going to get real good. Cause by the time you've done it for nine months, it's going to be much better than the time you did it for four weeks. And I think that's how gaming is too. We can't just expect, well, oh, at the end of the year, we will play a game and that shall solve everything. <laughs> like, no, it doesn't work. Like you have to tastefully infuse this or like any flavor in any dish, you can feel if you force it. And kid, gamers know that. Gamers are like, all right, this is, this is bogus. Just like any cool uh, teacher would call out cool math games and be like, uh-uh. You're going to be, I, I got something better for you. And I, I think when a kid goes, oh, okay, so you know what's up. You're like, yeah. So you're going to read my books? So like, yeah. Are you going to play my games? I'll try. And I think, you know, you've met your kids in the middle. There's this, there's this gap that used to exist. And there's been this team of teachers building a bridge on both sides. And I, I would say that um, teachers have built more of that bridge but I think the students are now finishing up that construction because now I think, you know, the, the, the teachers understand a little bit more about what's on the other side. And so it's, it's actually pretty cool. 
It's really interesting what you say. One, uh, I have a question related to the two previous topics, but before that, I want to agree with you on, um, I mean, personally, I'm not like a big fan of the adventure uh, games that you mentioned, but for me, when I was a kid, my main thing was I was playing Counter-Strike and, um, and Counter-Strike for me, it brought me to, I was very shy kid and I, I didn't know how, I mean, I was, I had friends, but very limited amount of friends. And when I started playing the game, I started opening up to a lot of people and I started having a team and that taught me a lot like leadership also because I was the in-game leader during, so researching, taking the, taking the time, researching the strategies and doing problem solving, understanding things before others understand. And this whole thing is also something we're trying to implement in Velo is all those skills that you can acquire in traditional sports uh, practice, you can acquire them as well in the esports uh, world where, where you play as a team or even through individual, but mental strength of, of playing in a competition. And um, yeah, I, I just think it's really cool that you're bringing that to the classroom. Um, and then the second thing I, I think um, I can relate to, and from a previous interview that we had with uh, Wimstock, who mentioned that this is a moment where there is a big gap between the young generation and the older generation, and not a lot of people are willing to go understand what they're doing. Like you were saying that um, um, you need to understand how they think, because for example, uh, the media, for example, they're thinking, okay, we put a lot of advertising on TV, but at the moment, the kids, they are not watching TV anymore. They, are, they want to interact with the entertainer on Twitch and then send some comment, chat with them. And it's a very different way of exposing the media. And I think, as you say, teaching is the same thing. There, there, there are some innovative way to bring teaching in the classroom with those resources that we have now. I, I, I mean, I, I'm gonna read more about this just after. Uh, I'm really, uh, and I will send probably an email to my high school when I finish <laughs> reading. Um, but um, so one question that uh, I have, and most of my friends who are teacher, one of the main struggle they have, and when we go uh, discuss and they can complain about their job, is they often uh, talk about parents being like immersive in the classroom, trying to bring their ideas and say and disagreeing with the teacher more and more, um, and uh, I, for anyone that any teacher who would want to bring gaming in 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 the in in the classroom i think it would be interesting to know if you faced any struggle in that area and how what were the challenge and how did you overcome those that's a good question i definitely think throughout the i i think i've been teaching with games now for like 7 7 years it started kind of it started with words with friends clash of clans clash royale um, it started with, you know, parent friendly things that parents could go, hey, you know, is this app acceptable for my kids? You know, there was some transparency there. Um, it started very simple. But then, you know, I started using more complex things and parents, you know, began to question maybe why was my kid playing games? Because when you ask your, you know, when a kid gets home from school and you and they finally respond to the question you ask them every day of, hey, so what'd you do in school? How'd you have a good day? Yeah, we played some games. Wait, well, wait, hold on a second, you know, and, and and kids don't go, oh, well, we also did a character development sheet and we cross analyze their meaning. They never say that. They say, oh, we played this game. It was so crazy all period. It was so much fun. I mean, you would hope kids would say that about anything, right? And so it's obviously suspect. <laughs> so, but then I also say to parents, you know, in a letter at the beginning of the year or at the beginning of the semester, hey, here's what we're doing. Here's some of the resources and I'll put the books, I'll put the games, I'll make it put out there to say, hey, you know, if you wanna look at, cause I'll say like even books are just as heavy, heavily criticized as, you mm -hmm. know, the games I would play. I mean, everyone wants to kind of like, well, my, I, here's what I think. And so I give everyone options. I've learned that, you know, if I'm going to differentiate my curriculum and I still want to, as a teacher, get the things across that I feel are important through the means that I think are necessary, then I will have options for those who do not want that, but I will not ostracize them and I will give them whatever means necessary. You know, if I was at a restaurant and someone didn't like the way I had my dish prepared as a chef, it might irk me, but I would still prepare it because I think that they're going to consume it still and it's going to benefit them. And I think when we choose what games to play, I think we have to be open. 
I would say, and and this is a bold statement, but I would say that most most books are more graphic and more intense than the games that they play. Um, and I would say that when I look at the banned book list and I see the stuff in there, it scares teachers to teach sometimes. I can find examples that parallel that in video games. And there's an old saying that someone said to me during my dissertation defense, Dr. Chris Holden, he says, you know, there's nothing so good that education can't ruin it. So Miles, how are you gonna protect games from being ruined like they've typically kind of done to books? Yeah, and a good example comes from uh, James G who mentions this in, in a video. He goes, you know, at the end of, of Halo, if you played Halo on hard and a kid beat it on hard, would you give that? Would you give that kid a test about Halo? He would say no. Obviously, he beat it on hard. He knows Halo, but yet when we read a text, we can't wait to make all of these test questions. I don't know a single author of any popularity that also made test questions at the end of their epic novel. <laughs> I don't know. Stephen King goes, "Now that you've read this, the greatest challenge awaits. Page nine hundred is my test." This never happened, right? And yet in school, we cannot wait to be like, oh, now, now you reach it. I go, games do this. They embed the assessment within. We call them bosses. We have these ways of assessing their ability inside. It already manages itself. But yet when we get to the end of a book or a chapter, we're going to test that kid. Well, you know, there are other ways. Find the bosses for your books. But, but try not to create new ones for the video game because it's already just perfectly designed. Hmm. Amazing. Yeah, no, that's uh, not only very funny, but um, <laughs> that's quite relevant. Um, I want to kind of start moving towards um, the future. Uh, I, I know you're working on a research, research book, really, with, um, is it 35 authors? Correct me if I'm wrong. I 35 um, plus, whew. 35 plus authors uh, and really looking at the quantitative uh, data of this space and, and building a foundation of understanding of where, where we're at. And I'm guessing that's going to be used as a bit of a launch pad for where, where we're going to go. With the, um, where do you, you know, for one, tell us a little bit more about the quantitative uh, pieces that you, you and other authors are doing uh, and then what you're hoping to see in the future with this space. Well, you know, come, I know that there's a lot of people who sometimes, you know, like going back to the question before about what do you tell parents? Well, honestly, what do you tell administrators and, and district leaders and, and everybody, all stakeholders? You tell them the truth, you show them the data. And I think going through my doctorate program, I struggled to find a lot of it. I, I saw a lot of conceptual and theoretical stuff, which was good. And, and there were, yes, examples of after school clubs that use games. But you know, I think five, six years ago, it was very hard to find prominent good teachers using games in a very meaningful way. I can think of people like James Tabor on YouTube who had some cool series about like, is Halo literature? And he had like a bunch of different games and I remember that inspiring me. I remember watching Extra Credits on YouTube, a great channel that started to have some cool video uh, videos about like games and literacy and their parallels. And so like, it was beginning to happen. Um, and now this book coming out is meant to kind of, and it, it's qualitative too. There's a lot of like, hey, I started this esports district in Canada and here's what I can learn. Or quantitatively, I was in uh, Southern California and made an esports league with over 49 teams. And here's what I learned across three states or whatever. And so there's data about um, attendance attrition. There's data about performance. There's data about people playing you know, CSGO um, and there's data about all kinds of things that we might not necessarily think about when we talk about esports and gaming, but they're so relevant to so many people because esports is interdisciplinary. So when I talk about like the benefits of a 15 chapter book on esports research, it's the fact that there's diversity there. There's five countries there. There's over 35 authors. There's not just the point of view of the primary education. There's higher education. There's college esports. There's middle school esports. There's practitioner research. There's quantitative data. There's perspectives from help cross and help you go, okay, like it. We have a beginning here, folks. And, and here's our first collection. And I know it's just the beginning because. I don't know. I, I think it's 
esports gaming is becoming more accepted and accepted is much different than like proven or like um on a mass scale like being used i think there's a lot of teachers like me out there who are doing really cool things who may not have publications or a youtube channel but i can say that they're doing they're doing it already and so for some of them they're like oh man like well i'm doing this i'm like well then shout out to you because you intuitively are doing the right thing and there's data out there that you could also be helping to share and contribute to in upcoming publications and so hmm. for the next one coming out in like hopefully at the end of this year 2021 maybe january 2022 um we start with the first kind of stone in the pond and i and i hope there's going to be another one um kind of cast out there and people are going to jump to that one but for now i feel like the field has had a lot of anecdotal proof a lot of, oh, well, I know this guy or this lady is running this esports club here and, and they're seeing good results. And you hear the positive things, but you really don't have any measures to show it. No peer reviewed work, nothing that kind of has been at any popular uh, conferences. And I tell you right now in academics, there's this world of like English language arts where we talk about Shakespeare. Uh, <laughs> and games don't belong and then there's like the tech educator world and like oh yeah games were cool man like of course and like i think they're gonna go to war soon because like they one side is like i don't know what you're talking about you know and the other is like <laughs> hey wait i heard there's this other group who like thinks and and it's interesting like now i'm like wait wait wait, wait we don't have to fight like i'm running through like <laughs> look at the data like no no uh, and so that's kind of where we're at with this book i'm running out with the white flag um, and it says information on it. And I'm like, everybody chill. Like it's neutral. I have stuff for everybody. Now look at my work cited, look at all the stuff that look at all the contributing authors, look at the editors, look at the transparency. And I think it's cool for the book because it's not just a bunch of professors. We have teachers. We have the voices of people who are in the field coaching esports. We have people who are in the field of making new teachers at the you know the best of universities, and we're all coming together kind of informally. Be like, yo, so let's do this. Who are we? The first to the party. Let's put something together. If um, do you think in your world, if if when this this data comes out and it, and it has the evidence that this is an incredibly powerful tool that the, the war will still happen, that people will still resist it. They will still refuse to accept it. There will be a resistance. There will be a resistance. Um, and I would say that, you know, naturally people's perceptions, and this comes from just some science. See, there's something called TPAC. It's the teacher's perceptions of, uh, I forgot the last ones, but basically, you know, when a teacher goes into the field, they have this perception about the use of technology. Are they going to use it all the time? Are they like kind of, are they going to stick with what they kind of know for the first 10 years and for the next 20 years of their career, they'll just kind of like, just kind of chill and not really entertain that. And I think that does happen. I think we see in the research that teachers at some point kind of be like, all right, I'm done. Like, I can't, I can't learn for the... I can't learn the 19th new board I've been given, right? And like, ah, I'm done. And this is the 49,000th website I've learned to, you know, and they're like, I'm done. I'm using what I know. And then they're like, and I think that happens. But yeah. I think the job of, of teachers or professors that teach teachers is to have them accept gaming going into their career so that the mindset throughout is that this is now an available resource. And so I've found in my career so far that training to be teachers about games is, for, is more effective than going into um, a lounge of teachers already teaching in their career and trying to make this big difference. And I will say though, that there are open-minded groups and I'm not saying that everyone is, is against it, but it's really easy to listen to this and then maybe go, eh, maybe it's not for me. But if I was to come to the school and to give like, um, you know, a professional development session, which I've done before, there's nothing better than walking into a room and telling a bunch of teachers, you know what we're going to be doing today? 
playing Fortnite and was like, what? I, uh, that, I hate that. That makes my kids, my kid. My. And they get all mad, right? Like wasted time. My kids already spent Why well, I can't believe we're doing this. And I'm like, whoa, all right, well, um, let's get to it. You know, and I, and I, and I take the, the initial, but then without fail, 20 minutes later, everyone's having the time of their life. The guy who never games is, is hitting Susie on the shoulder and Susie's laughing. She falls out of her chair and the teachers are, <laughs> are having a blast. And I go, time out, time out, time out. I go, hold on. You hear how much fun you're having? I got, I got you. See, this is it. I got you. And it's that same mm. moment when you finally catch all your kids reading and they're like really reading and you're like, oh my gosh, they're, they're, they're doing it. Like they, they, this story is good. And I go, time out everybody do you see how good this story is and they're like yeah can you shut up because we want to read now and i'm like let's do it you know and there's yeah. there's that going on it's crazy yeah and i think it's that understanding of it's not what it's not going to wipe out it's not going to wipe out classrooms what it what it is is just a tool that helps you do something or get something across it's it's no different to how technology has gone into sports um the game is still the same but yet there are purists who are like you've got to get rid of the you know tennis is a great example um you know you can't get rid of the human beings calling even if they're wrong about the line calls they've got to stay there and it's like well no we've actually got this technology that just keeps the game flowing we should use it but it's it's very similar situation that you're still a teacher you're still incredibly important you're just facilitating how it's introduced to how topics can be used and, I'm, and I, I have a theory that if you only used gaming, it would deteriorate it as well. You need to complement it. You need to balance it. Um, there needs to be a well-rounded, holistic approach. And yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good point. I would love to see those people playing Fortnite, by the way. I think that, <laughs> that would be that's so fun. Thing, yeah. <laughs> so where, where do you really see, but, you know, in your, in your, in your own understanding, five to 10 years, what, what does a classroom look like? If, if you, if you felt like, you know, a majority of, I mean, education curriculum started to head in this direction, what does a classroom look like? I, I think we've seen just looking at the data from the last five to 10 years and, and kind of continuing that trend and maybe looking at that as a point to go from, we've seen this initiative from STEM to STEAM right? We're adding the art now. And um, now I'm like, what other letters can we add? Isn't that just called normal school? Like, yeah, let's have them learn everything. Like, the, you know, that is, it's all kind of part of it, the arts. Um, and I think the immersive, the tech part is what's next. Maybe, um, maybe there's, there's an added gaming, a G or something. There's a, and I just think we can add more letters to steam. We can add more things, but I think that's what's going to happen in the classroom. There's going to be more things to do and it's going to be art-based, science-based, media-based. And I do think you're going to see VR devices that are as ubiquitous as Chromebooks in 10 years. I think you'll see that the cost of learning with technology is significantly lower. If you want to run a chemistry lab, it's a lot cheaper to run it with VR than it is to buy the chemicals every year for 10 years and to run every the liability. If you were to think about um, the use of maybe libraries renting out switches and having kids actually who are unable to afford them and being able to check them out and being able to do things. I think the school is going to eventually be a leader in being able to provide that access that was initially forbidden now they're going to provide access and because there's schools it will be equitable hopefully um, and those resources will be available to teachers who can't buy them on their own but like we're seeing now the teachers that are getting ahead are writing grants they're making things happen i didn't get the gaming computers in my classroom for free i had to write three different grants and i you know i have nice gaming rigs in my classroom but you know when we started esports they were on the all-in-ones and we, we ran it at 34 frames per second and you know what uh it was really hard to play on and and we just evolved from what we had um i think that's what's going to happen i think if you ask what we are evolved from and what we have in 2030 i'll say we have a lot and and if you were to say what could we grow from right now up until then 
we'll have the PlayStation 6. I mean, I don't even have my five yet. I, I can't even find <laughs> one. And in 10 years, there's going to be sixes that, you know, are going to have that weird like burn serial mark or whatever on the back. It's going to belong to whatever public school district. And I, I don't even have one in my class yet, right? I don't have one in my house. And I know that they're going to be PS6s in the classroom then. Yeah, no, that's that's really cool. It's really insightful. I um, We have one question we like to ask everyone who's on the show, and it's always relevant to what their their expertise is. But if you were an esports god um, and you had total and ultimate power, what would you change? <laughs> what would you change about the industry if you could? One, one, one major, one thing you could do right now. I would remove the stereotypes of what it means to be a gamer. I, I definitely think we're going through some big shifts. Um, when people look into my classroom, they go, oh, so these are those kids you're talking about. I'm like, yeah, who the heck did you think they were? Um, it needs to be representative of all people, of all cultures, of all religions, of all ideologies. I think gaming is just another sense of making, um, you know, trying to figure things out. And when you look at the stereotypes of who games or how they act, I think it's just naivety speaking. And I would like to see more LAN tournaments in the future and more media now that gaming has got a lot of attention over the virtual um, you know, pandemic. When we get LAN tournaments again, I bet you it's gonna be harder to get tickets to the Rocket League World Championships or the League of Legends, whatever. And good, good for the sport. You know, I just saw earlier today, there's 125,000 people watching Rocket League on Twitch. And I was like, that's a lot. Like, that's a <laughs> lot. Uh, you know, if I could stereotype all the people uh, playing and watching at that moment, probably 125,000 really cool people, right? And I think, I think a lot of us maybe tend to think about that person eating Cheetos and not listening to whoever's in the kitchen talking to them with their headset on. But I think it's far different than that. And uh, if we get a chance to maybe, like if I was, you know, the esports god here, I would zap everybody with like the men in black thing and start fresh right now with gaming and everyone would rush in at the same time and feel equal. Um, and yeah. I feel like we could start there. But we're facing a lot of, like anything else, trends and adversity from our past and it takes a while to fight them but i wish i could just be like no we're done all right let's move on equity let's go like that's my superpower no incredible um, a reset thank you, <laughs> thank you so much for coming today uh, i've been luke and i are really going to be looking forward to your to your to your book coming out with the other authors i think that'll be huge for for our our own company just for our own research and to understand where we're at um, if you're, if, if there's someone out there who wants to get in contact with you to know more about how you do what you do or, or some of the programs that you want, you run, um, how can people get in contact with you? Okay. You can, uh, look me up on YouTube is, is just a good resource for people looking at like, what does all this look like that you talked about today? You look up miles Harvey, my name on YouTube. Um, and you'll find a little gaming version of me up there. Uh, subscribe, go check out the stuff get what you need, download it, um, pass it along with a friend, but that's a great show and tell resource. Um, and another is to look me up on Google Scholar. Just look up Miles Harvey on Google Scholar and you'll have access to all my work. There's some things that you might have to look through digital access library, like a school internet system, or I don't know, you know, they're just, some things aren't just available because they're copyright owned by another journal. So you'll have to have access sometimes to a database, but um, if you want to read my first work about video games and virtual reality in the classroom, um, that was my dissertation. It's an eight chapter book. It's also for free. It's the first thing that shows up in my Google classroom. It's a great thing to kind of start with. Um, I think the stories in that speak to many of the kids around the world who are going through this. And so if, if that is not enough, you can look me up on LinkedIn, Miles Harvey. And uh, I will try and respond and, and help you or talk with your administrator or work with things like that and uh, try and support the cause. I know Valor Esports is doing um, a lot of cool stuff here. And so it's really neat to see um, all the work you're putting into. So catch uh, 
these two as well. They're also <laughs> great at providing you with a place. Uh, I need to hop more onto this community to, to, to figure out what I can learn as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, thank you once again. And um, it's been a pleasure. I've learned a lot. Of course. Thank you.